Gage, Max, and Joe. Gage, Max, Joe. Gage, Max, Gage, and, Max Joe. and Joe. YouTube live show. With Gage, Max, and Joe. Now the fight up and ready, fight up and ready to go. Gage, Max, Gage, Max, and Joe. Gage, Max, Joe. Gage, Max, and Joe. Gage, Max, Joe. Gage, Max, Gage, Max and Joe. YouTube live show. All right, welcome back to another episode of Out of System. Uh, we're here later joined by Caleb Banworth. She is a uh, she's a bronze medalist from the Rio Olympic Games. <laughs> what are you laughing at, Max? Because you said it, nothing, nothing. <laughs> she's awesome. It's going to be awesome to have her on the show. I'm not laughing at that. We were just laughing because this is our second take of the intro. So. <laughs> but we're our second time to charm. Um, Joe, Max, how are we doing today? Doing great. You know, I told Gage that, I'm going to pay him to shave his facial hair. I, he has some absolutely horrible facial hair. We were in an argument look at this morning about it, and it looks so bad and ugly. <laughs> There's a certain thing I'm waiting, That's why he get, I'm waiting for. There's a certain certain time that I'm waiting for to, to kind of shave it. You'll what know. time? What, what were you about to say? That's why. I'm oh, I get it. What do you I say, Matt? That. What do you get, Max? No, I get when he's going to shave it. There's a certain time. Yeah. I think I know that time. <laughs> and it'll be revealed on Auto System at a later date. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, in, in big men's volleyball news, uh, the film Match Point, I guess the documentary, the uh, Match Point, if you haven't watched it, it's on, uh, I think it's at USA Volleyball. Um, it just got released. It just got released, I think it was two days ago, I believe. Thursday. 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 So, it just got released then. And um, I watched it for the first time. And, uh, well, first of all, before I give, I want to kind of give my review of the film and all of us our review of the film. Um, the good and the bad, uh, or not the bad, but the, the not as good. The pros and cons, I think. Exactly. And um, just for a little a brief, we were there when they were – they came to the national team gym. Occasionally you see snips of me in there. So, I, obviously, I, I recognize myself. Um, so, I was like, oh, sweet, I'm in it, and stuff like that. So, that got filmed. What, what, is, it, what is it called in movies when they – the, the people in the back. The cameo. Extra, extra. We were extras. Gage yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I were extras. Yeah. We, were, we, were, Unpa- we were unpaid. We were, we were the national team at the right tile, to say that right there. So, um, so they filmed us last summer, and they had, they had they bring everyone in that gym into a room, and they kind of filmed everything. And the good thing is we knew the, the, the director because he played at Ball State. We played against him. I got to know the, the other film guys. They're, they're twins. They're awesome guys. I saw him at Nationals filming. So I kind of ran into them everywhere. Great guys, um, but let's get to the kind of the movie review. I'll start with the good. The good thing is that there's there is a. It's good that, that, that volleyball is growing as a sport. Men's volleyball is a sport. Women's volleyball is as big as you know. But for men's volleyball, it's good that you're kind of growing in the right direction, right? A documentary comes out. That's really really good. We're getting um, yeah John Spur out there, who's like kind of the head of men's volleyball, obviously as a U.S. national team coach, and uh, you just kind of see it moving in in a good direction. And then also it's. Um, not just focusing on, on, you know, Mike Christensen and, and all those guys, but also hearing the stories of what's like in the Midwest. Cause we, we always lived in, we lived in Rochester, New York, and we always had a good club team there. And then we came to California. We've always kind of had a good club team there. You, uh, Max, you would kind of know about, I mean, what is it, What would you say the differences between uh, the Midwest or, or Chicago and like, and like California where you see it in Hawaii? Yeah. Like, what's the difference? Like, what the I think there's a lot. I mean, he talk, the reason you bring up the Midwest stuff is because I think he used to coach at Vortex, and I think actually Dalton yeah. had him as a coach. And yeah, he did. Yeah. Um, but anyway, no, yeah. Totally di- different atmosphere, you know what I mean? And there's a uh, right. smaller size, sample size, you know what I mean? There's just so many clubs, it seems like, even in NorCal. And, but it's gr- for sure growing in the Midwest. But I think the thing is, like, you look at big conferences and stuff in the Midwest, like there's one Big Ten team that even has a – men's volleyball program you know what i mean right right so i think i think well, it's growing though now too it's just going to no, a lot for of sure, yeah. like there's like tournaments out there but mm-hmm. uh but back to the kind of the review here but the good thing is you get a different perspective you're getting to get a different view of, they bring in different players different coaches that kind of show the different thing now my i guess you say cons or problems with the film is this the whole what i what i got the gist of it the whole the whole goal of that film at least we were told at the time was to kind of grow the game of men's volleyball and the thing about that is you see the NBA, you see the NFL, you see all these other players. They will key around their top players, right? 
NBA, you see LeBron James. You see Kawhi Leonard. You see Kevin Durant. You see their top guys. And with this film, I don't think men's volleyball is at a point where you can kind of breach away from kind of the smaller stories or, or still a great story, but not recognizable faces or anything like that. So my problem was you can't really grow the game by not showing your top guys. You need to make those guys like the big, the LeBron James of men's volleyball, like the KDs, and that's where you have to start. And I kind of felt like that wasn't there. You know, you saw a little Mike Christensen in that film, a few other, a few snippets of the national Kavika team guys. Shoji. Kavika Shoji. But other than that, there wasn't much of that. And, and, and I feel like we're not at a point where we can afford to do that. you got to focus on your main guys to grow it, right? So because there's a lot of people in that film that I didn't even know who they were and were, and we're in the volleyball community, right? So I don't mm-hmm. get how that kind of helps grow the game. Now, yeah. if, the, if the whole thing was to kind of – the whole documentary was just kind of just like show different perspectives, and yeah, that definitely did the job. But that, I don't think that was the goal of that film. And I think in the future, we need to kind of push that more, push your best players, and then kind of start to branch out and then kind of grab their interest. And another thing was um, it's also just kind of showing them. It was a lot of it was like, oh, go watch this, go watch that. But you're not going to get people to – you're not gonna. If I just go tell you, oh well, watch this. I mean, that's not gonna happen. You need to actually show them something, like cool. Show them all this other kind of stuff and make it kind of accessible, accessible kind of kind of thing. Um, just right. I think that there's a lot of personalities too. Right. Oh my bad, I cut you off. No, 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 no. You're totally good. No, yeah, I feel like there's a lot of like you can really grow a sport, Joe. Exactly. I think you'd agree on this too. We talked about uh, Conor McGregor before, and like what he did for just like alt- like MMA stuff is like he's just this really interesting guy and men's volleyball has a lot of guys like that. You know what I mean? And you guys know him better just from the national team. There's a lot of interesting personnel. Like we just, even one guy that comes to mind is Dustin Watt, man. Like he's just right. you meet that dude. And he's just got a very, he's got a very interesting personality. A, a lot of unique people. I don't know what you think about Joe. Did you watch it too with Gage? Yeah, I watched most of it. I, I had something going on. I forgot. I wasn't able to catch the end of it. But I, we talked about this before on the show that we want to see a bigger media presence in the volleyball world. And for sure, like a video like that is huge. And it's awesome that somebody put it, they put in a lot of work for that. I know yeah. they interviewed a lot of different people. Gage and I did get interviewed for it. <laughs> Didn't make the cut. We're, we're I mean, unpaid extra. extras though. <laughs> it's all right. The, the, but the, the, the goal of the film is also, we need a lot more stuff like that. And in men's volleyball, especially you hear them talking about on the show or, or on the, on the film that, you look at sports like golf or those kind of those kind of sports that just started growing and are bigger in like national media presence, national TV. They're on TV more, and the reason is because they have these superstar athletes that everybody can relate to. You look at cycling with Lance Armstrong. There was a documentary released about him. He transformed the world of cycling. Uh, and that's I, where I mean. And that's what cycling just like pumped into them. Yeah, and and, pumped into and, all, yeah, the and all, all the media, so they just dumped every, all their money into it, and they made him kind of the poster child of that. Swimming, Michael Phelps. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you can, you can go on with a bunch of different uh, vi- uh, videos with that. And for uh, for me, it's it's pretty it's pretty cool to, to see that they spent so much uh, time on it. It's cool that we're getting like more media presence, and yeah. they do a film like that. But uh, like. I, I think I understand Gator's points for sure, but I also understand like we need to start somewhere. So yeah, that's true. It's, I mean, it's a good, good starting ground. It yeah. seems like for sure. Hopefully, there's more to kind of come. Um, hopefully, not one of those horrible, horrible Hollywood Hollywood mo- volleyball movies that come out like All You've Got and all those horrible, or, horrendous movies. Or the greatest volleyball scene that will ever be made: the scene from Top Gun <laughs> in jeans. <That's> so sick. <laughs> all right, that all right, inspired me. <laughs> let's get to our interview here we got kayla banworth uh please welcome her on the show all right joined here by past olympian current old miss coach kayla banworth how are we doing thank you so much for joining us today kayla doing really well really well how are you guys doing yeah we're, we're hanging in there you know we're hanging in there day by day yeah um so you're joining us from oxford mississippi is, is that correct that's correct. Yep. Well, how is life over there? How, I mean, have you guys started up the volleyball scene yet or what's kind of, what's kind of the deal with that? Yeah. Life's good. Life's weird for everybody, but um, yeah, I've been here since January one. So I got to meet the girls and start doing stuff with them for spring season. Um, and then things got shut down. So everything's right. on pause. So that kind of sucks, but um, things are really good here. It's a cool town, really cool. Um, university to be a part of and 
life's good. Now you, you were before this, you were coaching in Nebraska as, as assistant coach, right? Mm-hmm. And then yep, kind of moved Dylan. over there. How, I mean, that's gotta be kind of a, a culture shock moving from Nebraska to all the way to Mississippi. What, what were the kind of the big differences that kind of hit you immediately? Um, there's de- like the Southern charm is real, right? right. <laughs> like the manners and the politeness and, you know, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. And, um, you know, just this is just a different feel, different vibe down here, which is really, really cool. Um, but it's not too different. You know, Nebraska is kind of like that. Yeah. Um, and Lincoln and Oxford are similar and like, they're both a really cool college town and everything, you know, centers around the, the school's athletic teams. So cool, yeah. similar, right. but you know, a couple differences here and there. So one, one thing I kind of want to get into here is you've coached in the Big Ten with, uh, with Nebraska, and then now you're in the SEC with uh, Ole Miss. So Big Ten obviously is a powerhouse in, in, in women's volleyball, and SEC is on the rise. You know, you got a few teams here, but no one kind of breaking that surface yet. And I know that you haven't been there for long. So what would you say is the – I don't want to say the biggest difference, but what do you feel like, okay – because SEC, again, big football teams, you got the money to kind of fund everything, and so it's the Big Ten schools. So what do you feel like needs to happen in the SEC, in Ole Miss, so you, for you guys to kind of reach that Big Ten level? Wow, that's a really, really good yeah. question. Um, I'm not really sure, to be honest. You know, I, I, you're, you're right, I haven't been here that long, so I'm still trying to navigate through all that. But, um, you know, the Big Ten obviously just gets – they get all the best recruits right now. Um, so I think we got to start winning some, some of those big recruiting battles. Um, and I think that might be step one, but to be honest, I don't really know the answer. I'm, I'm, I'd love to figure it out though. So if you guys think of anything, (laughs) you know, being in Nebraska, obviously you got to work under coach John Cook for uh, some time. You got to play under him in terms of the recruiting battles and, uh, style of recruiting. What was the biggest thing you learned from him? Because we get a lot of questions from kids like, how can I get recruited better? What? What are coaches looking for? What is something that you learn from him from a coaching perspective that you're going to take with you now um, to your new program? Yeah, something that's really important for coaches is, is how do we vibe with you? Um, not necessarily off, on the court, but off the court. You know, what kind of person are you? You know, what are your characteristics? Um, what sort of personality things are you going to be bringing to our team? Um, those are really, really important to coaches. Um, and you know, are you, are you going to click with us? Are you going to connect with us? How do you, how do you learn? How, how do you communicate? You know, all those little things that um, help a team really gel together, um, you know, not necessarily on the court are things that we're looking for. So I would say that's the biggest thing is you got to really get to know your coaches that you're, you're going to go play for. And you gotta, you gotta show them who you are as a person and, and figure out how you guys vibe together, how you guys connect for sure. At Ole Miss, is there is there any beach program there too? No, there's not. There's, I mean, the SEC is really is lacking in in the beach yeah. side of the game, and I know that's that's a big um, battle that a lot of the coaches in the SEC are fighting for. But I think I think it's a few years out still. I mean, I feel like because the national championships hosted in the Gulf Shores of Alabama, right? So that makes and there's no team practicing there. Like if the national championships not happening. Right. It's no, no, it's, it's crazy. And, you know, beach volleyball is, is almost, you know, as big as, as indoor volleyball is here. Um, indoor volleyball in Mississippi is really, really young and, and it's right. got a, a lot of growing to do. So yeah, it's, it's kind of amazing that there's no beach volleyball. I know that that's on the bucket list for a lot of SEC coaches, but who knows? Yeah. For, and for you, you made the transition pretty kind of rapidly we were talking about how I think he was gonna ask something about you uh working with the Pepperdine men's team a little bit but for you going from player to coach what was the biggest thing you had to change because I see too many times where players while they're coaching they'll go coach like a club team or they'll go help out and they just there's like no separation between they can't it's really hard for them to separate like the mindset and they're always talking about like this this is what I would do like in this is like they're always talking about themselves but I think players get tired of hearing that a lot <laughs> it's like what you would do like uh <laughs> when so I, what was like the biggest difference for you and something that you had to learn maybe uh when you made that transition yeah you you kind of hit the nail on the head um when I started coaching I, I saw the game a lot you know f- through my own eyes and like how I saw the game instead of trying to relate to how my players saw the game and how they needed to improve you know I, I asked the question a lot. I was like, how did you not see that? 
you know, like the, yeah. that kind of question where it's like, okay, don't, you know, it's not about you anymore. You know, it's about them and, and how, what they're seeing and how they're feeling and how they're learning. And, um, especially as a professional athlete where, you know, it's all about how do I maintain my body? How do I get better? How do I keep making rosters? Me, 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 me. The focus shifts entirely off of you and onto your players and, and how, how can I make them better? So it's, it's two totally different worlds. Um, and there was definitely a learning curve, but I think that's probably the biggest thing I learned. Right on. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, and I, I'm just, like, I'm super interested in like the recruiting process. I love that kind of process of, and kids all the time are asking because our family run a cat volleyball Academy. So we're talking with kids a lot about that. And so for you, uh, interesting question, Hawaii, you know, when they would bring out recruits, I know on the men's side, they, they would take them spear fishing or they would take them on all these crazy things. I was wondering at Ole Miss, if you had any plans or if you've already. You guys doing anything cool? Anything crazy? Yeah. What do you guys do? Like what's the coolest thing that you would do or have done with a recruit? Oh gosh. I don't know about, Ole Miss. I mean, the one thing, I mean, I guess I haven't even, I've had two visits here at Ole Miss because of the dead period because of the COVID. Yeah. Um, but we have like a Oxford is really small. It's like 20,000 people, but we have like a, a downtown area that's called the square and it's like super Southern vibe, like um, has like a saloon, like Western, like Southern kind of vibe. And it's got really cool restaurants down there, really cool shops. So I normally take them down to the square. Um, and you know, if there's a athletic event on campus, that's normally something you go to. I know like Morgan Freeman comes to all the basketball games Okay. yeah so just like really weird it. like archie archie eli manning come to the football games so um that's really cool yeah take them to do those kind of things um but in lincoln everything was about football and volleyball so right. we would always take recruits to the football games we'd go on the sideline meet scott frost um and you know be in that stadium of, of 90,000 people so I feel like that's the same because especially in SEC like you hear about all these things about like an SEC football game so I feel like that'd be pretty similar you know just bring him down to the field or uh, anything similar to that but um so as, as just Joe kind of alluded to I want to kind of ask you about playing um with your professional career so you decided at a part of your career you decided to instead of go overseas you decided to kind of train in the U.S. and Correct me if I'm wrong. You trained with the men's program, right? Uh, yeah, a little Pepperdine. bit. <laughs> yeah, you trained. You were training with the the Pepperdine men's team instead of kind of going overseas. What was kind of the reasoning for that? And then what are the what would you say the pros and the cons are of just kind of staying? Yeah. Home? So I made the decision to stay home and train in California, um, mainly because I was able to make just as much money from USA doing that as I did right. going to play overseas. Um, and also, I got one-on-one -on -one training with our strength coach, Jimmy Stitz, and one-on-one -on -one training with Karch every day. Um, and then I did have that opportunity to go and help out with the men's program at Pepperdine and hang out with Marv every day. Right. So not a bad situation there. Got to learn a lot about coaching. Um, but it was actually kind of crazy because when I was doing that, I was coaching in Malibu, but I was still training in Anaheim. So oh, I was... Yeah, it was, it was crazy. So I would wake up at 4.30 every morning and drive up to Malibu, beat traffic, coach like the first half of the day, and then drive back down over the lunch hour and train in Anaheim for like three or four hours and kind of rinse and repeat that wow. cycle every day. <laughs> so exhausting. That was pretty gnarly, but I mean, you get to hang out with Marvin Dunphy every day and learn from him and, and those guys on that team that year were, were super cool to be around. Um, yeah. But you know, overseas isn't for everybody. And, and I played three seasons overseas and just kind of learned it wasn't for me. And it, mostly from like a, a mental health standpoint, I just wasn't right. happy over there. And some people love it overseas. Some people hate it overseas. It's just kind of, you know, different strokes for different folks. But um, I decided to stay home just for those reasons. And I think if I was like a hitter or a setter, then losing out on that six on six time would have been a little bit more detrimental to me. But right. I think as a libero, I could get away with it a little bit because, you know, I just had to serve and uh, serve or not serve, uh, pass and play defense yeah. and, and get those reps that way. Um, so I guess it's just, it's whatever you prefer, however, you know, whatever makes you happy and, and you know, find ways to make it work, I guess. Yeah, you, you brought up Marv. He was, that was on my recruiting sort of process. That was one of the trips I took to Pat. And he was, he's one of the coolest people in the sport. <laughs> he was, so cool. we got to go up to his house, uh, his wife for, for dinner. And it was the, 
yeah, he's awesome. What do you have any? Because I've heard a bunch of stories from Pat guys, and so I was wondering if you had any story that stuck out with you from your time working with him, or something that you just heard. Um, I don't know if I have like one particular story, um, but he went to Rio with us actually in the Olympics, and he. I don't think he was on the bench, but he was on the end line with Joe Trinzi. Um, and we had like a team room in Rio. And anytime anybody walked into the team room, there was always a game of finete happening. And Marv was always in the game. Like it was always Marv and like a plethora of other people. Like, so he kind of led the, the finete charge in Rio. But yeah, That's he's cool. a great guy. Super cool to be around. Now, now you say you were at Rio for... I heard, I don't know if it's true, but you guys had to uh, kind of stay in a hotel offsite once the games kind of started for you guys. Were you kind of, I mean, from a focusing standpoint, I'm sure that's, that's ideal, but was that kind of like, oh man, I wish I kind of stayed in the Olympic Village. And then how much time did you eventually get like for the closing and opening ceremonies in the Olympic Village? Yeah, so we actually stayed the first few nights in the Village just because Karch wanted us to be able to experience that. Right. Um, but by the end of those, you know, couple days, we were like, okay, get me out of here because there was just so many distractions. <laughs> right. Like, the, like the food was really bad. Like it just wasn't, it, it's, it wasn't what I was expecting. Like I was expecting it to be this really awesome like experience. And, and then eventually it was just like, okay, get me out of here. Um, so, yeah, it's surprising, but like, it was like dorm style and just all these other, it was just really, it was not ideal. Um, and yeah, but, and then, so we moved off, off the village um, to a hotel because our commute from the village to the gym would have been two hours one way by bus. Oh just based God. on like traffic and real, like it would have been a mess. So we got into a hotel like much, much closer to the gym, um, which was really nice. And then, you know, we had a restaurant down the street, make food every time, every meal. And it was really, really good food. And so it was nice to kind of be away from the village and be away from that distraction. No, absolutely. The, and I, that kind of ties in your international. Were you, which years were you back in the U.S. playing and what were the, what were the clubs you played or did you only play for one club in those three years overseas? Yeah, my first year I played for uh, Schwecket in Vienna, Austria. And then my second year, so my first year would have been 2011. My second year, 2012, I played in Dresden, Germany. And then my third year, I played in Baku as Rajan for Rabita. Um, and then my fourth year is the year at 2014, I think it was right after we won world championships was when I decided to stay in California and train. So I got like, yeah, two summers or two winters, I guess, in California to train by myself. And uh, from, from your, during your playing career, were you always set on going and coaching afterwards? Or was that something that just kind of grew like as you went through your playing career, you're like, Oh, maybe I still want to stay around the sport. Yeah. I think I, I always knew I wanted to stay around the sport and, I think you know how it is when you're you're an athlete you kind of have this tunnel vision and that's all you are, you know really are and you know I hadn't really thought about life post playing that much and um I knew I wanted to stay on the sport and coaching just kind of seemed like the natural next step so decided to pursue that after Rio got over and then luckily Nebraska opened up so it was kind of like a right place right time type of situation and kind of hit the ground running there right right and I, I feel like when it comes to kind of sports, it comes to, obviously, it's all about a lot of its connections, right? You're like you were with Marv, and then that's who – you went directly from the national team into Pepperdine. Am I right? Or, no? or, or at the same time, you were saying? Same time, yep. Right. So I feel like not everyone gets experience high level of volleyball. Not everyone gets those kind of connections. But I, but I think that, especially towards kind of the end of your career, you should kind of start – I mean, I'm sure you realize you should kind of start thinking about, okay, what's my next step after that? And I feel like it's very important to develop, to develop connections because volleyball is a very – well, any kind of sports world is going to be kind of a small world. Everyone knows each other. So how is important is it if you want to get in the coaching world as a high-level player, how is important is it to you or, or how do you approach kind of getting those connections and kind of getting kind of jobs and until, until you find, kind of find that fit for you? Yeah, I mean, I think you're, you hit it – again, you hit the nail on the head. you got to make those connections and, and I think you got to start spreading the word that you want to be a coach. Um, especially for, you know, collegiate players or professional players, you know, a lot of people don't know that you want to coach when you're done playing, like they don't know what you want to do. So you have to start putting the word out and, and just getting in everybody's ear and, um, you know, yeah, I want to go into coaching, you know, keep my name on your tongue. Like if anyone's asking, 
Um, so you really, you gotta basically start a rumor, you know, like, Hey, I'm, I want to go into coaching. I'm looking for jobs and, um, try and meet as many people as you can. And, um, I mean, I would send, I send cold emails out after Rio, um, just saying, Hey, I want to get into coaching. Do you have any advice? Do you know of anybody that's looking? Um, and you know, I just got done playing in the Olympics and I still was sending out cold emails. So, um, as much as you can talk to people, as much as you can just get the word out there that you're looking to get into coaching, then, you know, that'll kind of spread a little bit. And did, at Ole Miss, did you get to bring your own assistants or did you uh, retain the uh, same ones from before? Uh, so I got to hire my own assistants. I hired Bo Lawler. He was the technical coordinator at Nebraska with me and is currently trying to mount my TV back there. <laughs> 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 um so he came with me from Nebraska and then I hired Maggie Scott, who was formerly at LaSalle and she was a setter at Oregon. Um, so she's my recruiting coordinator and Bo's my defensive coordinator. Um, and then I just hired a director of ops from Utah Valley named Kent Nita. And I have two graduate managers coming on, Maddie Beal, who played at Minnesota and oh, yeah. Lori Glasker, who played at Santa Barbara. So... Yeah, I got to bring my entire staff. Um, the strength coach was here previously, and he's great. So I'm excited to work with him. Uh, same as the athletic trainer, she was here previously, um, and she's great as well. So I think I have a pretty solid staff. That's awesome. No, I, I that's so important. I, I, I saw that from like when I was being recruited and just playing in college, like how important having like a good staff around you is because there's no top level coach who doesn't have like the assistant coaches are just high level <laughs> there's not in every program that is in the top 10 rankings like the entire coaching staff top to bottom is so elite and down to the technical coordinator coordinator I learned that on my first uh, like youth national team trip our technical coordinator we had was just like he knew so much I, me and Mike Ma'a uh, who played at UCLA he was we were so impressed by that. We're like, geez, like everybody here just knows so much. And yeah. I think that's I think super the technical crucial. coordinator like does more than anybody, to be honest. Yeah. Their, their jobs during like international tournaments for technical coordinators, their life is hell. It's <laughs> that gnarly. is brutal. Rio, we had, um, Rio, we had Joe Trinzi and JJ Van Neal, who's now at USC. were down there. <laughs> and I swear they didn't see daylight for like two weeks. They just sit in the gym. Like if, for, yeah. people, for people who don't know, they sit in the gym and they record every single match in the tournament. They just sit there and you have maybe get food brought to them, but they're just like on their yep. computer watching matches. But for, so for you, well, last couple of questions. When you're, when you're looking to build for the future of your program and your team, what, is, what are they going to be the key components from, I mean, you talked about what you're looking for in individual athletes, but from a team perspective, what are you hoping the team is going to look like? And in the future, what type of athletes are you going to be recruiting? Like what positions do you really um, uh, go after in the recruitment process and that you value? I mean, I, I uh, this is going to sound biased, but I'm first and foremost looking for people that can pass the ball. Bingo. <laughs> That's, all right, Setters well, like to hear that too. I have, I have one, one quick thing. People, from libero to libero, people underestimate libero position in an insane way. You got to realize if you have a good libero, it makes everyone else's life easier. It makes your hitters look way better. And it, let's say if you have two not so great passers, but you have a really good libero, that makes them look like really good passers. And it can make anyone like like people are like, oh no, I got to get this. I'm like, just get your passing down first. Just get a libero. And they're like, no, 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 no. And I'm yeah. just like, all right. Like you don't see you don't see a great team without a great libero. Like you yeah. don't see any great team with like an average libero. Like right, exactly. I totally agree. And I mean, I could go down this rabbit hole so long. But yeah. When oh, I, yeah, I get that. every year. This is my pet peeve. Like when all American awards come out, and there's like two libero all Americans. Yeah. And like seven Those... three rotation players. <laughs> and and some of those guys are like I'm like or or girls are like that guy or that girl like really like. But it, and it's like there's I'm not trying to take away anything from them. They're very talented and they're like. Yeah ridiculous they do things that i would never have been able to do but not without that pass they didn't exactly <laughs> exactly I feel that. gosh i feel that so much because you see like <laughs> we'll try it. people are like oh yeah we'll just throw like the uh the unathletic kid who can't really do anything put him in put him in the libero jersey go <laughs> get it go get him it's like yeah. you don't get it you, it like but again we're liberos and people aren't gonna listen to us whatever but we yeah. have well you're you're in a position of power so you can make that you can make that kind yeah, of yeah yeah i'm definitely looking for passers um the setter position obviously is, is very important. Joe, you know, that is somebody that as a head coach, I need to really connect with and 
we need to be on the same page in terms of style and system. Um, so that's, you know, quite the process when it comes to recruiting. Um, but then, yeah, obviously you need players that can put the ball away. Right. For you, for, who's your, who is your setters right now? Or is there, do you have an older setter or are they fairly Yeah, so my setter, um, I have two on the, on the roster right now. One's going to be a senior, Lauren Bars. Um, and then the other is a walk-on freshman, Callaway Kaysen. She played at A5 Club in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and then I have, actually I have a third setter. I just got a transfer from Clemson, um, Gabby Easton. So I have three setters on the roster um, and they'll be, they'll be duking it out. Bars has yeah. been on the court the last couple of years, but I, I already told them, you know, the best setters are going to be on the court. So we'll see For what sure. happens. You know, uh, kind of last, I, last question, unless you had something else. Speaking of walk-on, we didn't realize we we did some we did some research here, and uh, we were it was we we didn't even realize that you were walking out in Nebraska. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I yeah. <laughs> what did you just get like when you went back and coach for Coach Cook? You just like you didn't even give me a scholarship. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's kind of funny because. When I first, when the job opened up in Nebraska, I text Coach Cook and I was like, hey, like I'm looking to get into coaching. Like, would you consider me as an assistant? And he sent back, he, he said one word. He just goes, no. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, okay, cool. Good luck. Um, they, and well, then I, I guess they must have not had found anyone else because he texted me like a month later and was like, all right, we're going to interview on Monday. I was like, okay. <laughs> It's um, a roller coaster of emotions. There. Yeah, it was bizarre, but that was kind of the same with my recruiting process. You know, I didn't really get recruited by him. Um, I went on a visit to Nebraska myself, just like through admissions and bought tickets to the volleyball game and, you know, experienced all of that by myself. And I called Coach Cook and I was just like, hey, I'm, I'm going to come play at Nebraska. And he was like, wait a minute, slow your roll, kid, you know. And, um, you know, I asked him just to come watch me play and just kind of sat around and then waited for him to 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 offer me a spot on the team Man. yeah but yeah i did start as a walk-on and then um eventually started earning some scholarship money yeah i mean you hear about those story like that type of story all the time and when you go to camps or when you go like they said they tell you like oh this person or this athlete started here they were a walk-on or they were at the bottom of the camp or whatever and then they went on to be the national team but the actual reality, the percentage of that actually happening is so slim. Like, so, so it's, that's, it's I mean, that's incredibly impressive. So. Thank you. Yeah. And when Joe told me that it was, I was like, Oh crap. Going from a walk on to the national team <laughs> the barrel. That's, that's impressive. That is very, very impressive. <laughs> um, well, Kayla, thank you so much for your time. We've had a great time talking to you, you know, hopefully, I mean, not hopefully, but I know you're going to get six little barrels on the court at one time, you know, we got to come down and visit love. Ole Miss one time. We got to come to a game. For sure. You guys are more than welcome whenever you want to come. I'd love that. That'd be awesome. Um, Kayla, thank you so much for your time. And uh, we wish you nothing but the luck, best of luck and, and good luck this season. Thank you for joining right. us. Thanks, guys. Kayla Bandsworth. Um, There's no S in her name. God damn. Kayla Bandsworth. Oh, my God. I was, that's the one thing I suck at is the names. <laughs> good thing we got it. Joe has to go through the names at least four or five times. I have to. I yeah. write it down usually. <laughs> I, and I didn't, didn't write, write it down, down today. Time. Today I didn't write it down, but you yeah. said I write the full name. Engage always messes it's the like, name. It's not on purpose. He's not purposely messing up the name every time. He just It's like Ron Burgundy. It's like anything you put in the prompter, he'll read it. <laughs> just like he'll read it. <laughs> Except it's right. the opposite. Yeah. Uh, really interesting. No, I, I want to bring this up, but I was going to say this for the outro. When she was bringing up the travel in Brazil and the food and stuff, it, it reminded me of last – summer when i went to the pan am games in peru and she was saying how it took uh it would have taken two hours ago from the olympic village to their venue we had <laughs> we stayed in the village with our team last year team usa and we had to go two hours each way to the match one day it took two and a half hours the bus driver was driving it, it was it was wow he was driving all the different routes all the, one night we were coming back we played a late night match and we were coming back and all of a sudden he turns down a street that's not lit at all completely dark and we were <laughs> like it's, it's kind of a sketch area and we pull up and he stops the bus in the middle of the street straight oh, black like you can't see it and we were freaking out that i that popped in my mind when she was talking about her time in brazil and her time in rio last summer brazil brazil yeah you didn't get that vip treatment bro you gotta be you gotta be on the olympic uh olympic uh wait 
They got third, Rio. I swear they got men and women both got third. Uh, who they lose to? Brazil, probably. Mm, no, I don't. Uh, we have to research that one. Don't look at me. Clearly, you've done a research. <laughs> <here>. <laughs> you guys both. I was like, I don't know. <laughs> Max, our volleyball analyst, analysis. Yeah, I think it was. Uh, it was for sure Max Brazil. Our historian. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, um, Kayla Bandworth. Bandworth. I got that right. Um, she's. There's no D either, though. I said ban. Not banned. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I said that. Okay. I said that. I said that. All right, all right. Before I scope anything else, we've had a lot of fun shooting this show, and this has been another episode out of system.